Welcome. Um, today's speaker in our Clemson Computational Math Seminar is uh, Bruno Gle from the Polytechnique Montreal in Canada. He's an assistant professor there, and um, he is in chemical engineering, and he works on computational fluid dynamics. And he's going to present us a, uh, an open source code that he has been working on. And this code is based on the DEAL2 library. And that's why one of the reasons I'm really interested in his talk. Uh, so Bruno, please go ahead. Perfect. Well, uh, first, uh, I'd like to thank you for the invitation, Timo. It's uh, very nice for me to be here. So I'll be talking today about uh, this open source platform we're developing and how we're using it for the simulation, the design, and the optimization of chemical processes using numerical simulation. So uh, maybe just a few words about Polytechnic Montreal. So I'm from Canada. So as we would see in the US, I'm, I'm uh, from north of the wall. Uh, and uh, so Polytechnic Montreal is one of uh, uh, Canada's largest engineering institution. Uh, there's about eight to 9,000 students and over 200 professors. And it's quite active in terms of uh, fundamental and applied research as an institution. So uh, in my group, we are interested in the simulation, the prediction and the intensification of multi-phase flows that are used in chemical engineering. And so multi-phase flow, they play a key role in multiple unit operation, whether it is a fluidized bed reactors or agitators in which we are suspending particles. So a good example is the first movie you'll be seeing right now. So this is a liquid fluidized bed. So you don't necessarily see it well, but there is a continuous liquid, liquid flowing throughout all these particles. And in real life, this could be, for example, used in wastewater treatment or to carry out a chemical reaction. In this case, the particles, they would be a catalyst, for example, so rare metals or alloys. At the right, you see another application on which we work extensively, which is mixing. So either mixing of complex fluids or rheologically complex liquids, or also a liquid mixing a multi-phase system. So in this case, we're trying to suspend particles. And these, we have applications that range from, for example, polymer recycling or pyrolysis to other more advanced or complicated chemical reactions. So what is peculiar about these multi-phase flows is that their dynamics is extremely nonlinear, and there is a very strong interaction between the fluid and the particle at the particle scale. And in a way, this, dic this dictates the large scale behavior of the flow. And it's very complicated because what happens at the millimeter scale is going to affect the chemical process at the meter or half a meter scale. So today I'll be talking about the work we've been doing with this development of an open source platform called Lite. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about what's under the engine. So what's the type of stabilized finite element approach we use within Lite, the weak form and uh, how we solve the equations they, themselves. And uh, I also explain uh, and discuss some of the problems or examples of problem we study. So we work a lot on early turbulent flows granular flows and multi-phase flows. I wanted to talk about rheologically complex fluids, but then I realized I would have uh, ended up with 70 slides and it would have been the machine gun of slides. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a bit slower and talk about one less thing. So, and then in the end, I'll try to have some conclusions about what we learned along the way, what works well and what remains to be improved. So I'll, I'll try to be as transparent as possible with this presentation. You know, when we do presentation about CFD and applied math, everything looks so smooth. But in the end, there's always jagged edges in, you know, inside the machine or something. So I'll try to pinpoint those out. Not everything is working perfectly. We still face considerable challenges. And this is part of science. And I like it this way. So what is Lete? Lete is a computational fluid dynamic platform and a discrete element platform. It uh, enables the use of high order schemes. It has a multi-physics coupling engine for heat transfer, uh, multi-fluid simulation, particle simulation, and also uh, tracers, so uh, advection diffusion of a passive scalar. It includes some robust nonlinear linear solver, and it has dynamic mesh adaptation capabilities. One of its nice, very nice features I like the most is the discrete element method module for Lagrangian particle tracking and particle collision with wall. So Lete is fully open source under an LGPL license. You can download it from GitHub. And we have a nice uh, documentation now based on Sphinx. One of my intern cooked this up, and I'm very happy about it. So the key point of this slide is at the bottom right. Uh, Lite is based on DL2, and Lite is really just a DL2 solver. You can see it as a DL2 example on, on crack in a way. Uh, everything we use, all the numerical methods, the key object, everything would not be possible without DL2. The particle modules is extremely based on the DL2 features. So we're, I really see this as a, an application where DL2 is the, the core material and the core architect behind what we're doing. So it's I would say it's an expression of a slight uh, fraction of what DL2 can achieve. 
So uh, we work on four, let's say, four areas of research to which we are very active. The first one is computational fluid dynamics. So this is an example of simulation we routinely carry. So what you see at the right is a continuously agitated vessel. So we have an impeller. In this case, it's just uh, six blades fixed to a shaft. And they are rotating. And these will generate complex flow structures. And using dynamic mesh adaptation, we're able to capture these things. Uh, another application we're working a lot is the simulation of granular matter, and this I will spend a lot of time talking later on in my presentation. So this is an example. So here, instead of trying to model particles as a fluid with a very complex rheology, we model particles as particles using simplified contact model. And with this, we're able to reproduce very complex granular behavior. You see, for example, here we have an angle of repose. So particle, they are slowly avalanching, and we have a jet of particle that is spreading out as it is emptying in the other container. We also try to look at particles at, at the flow around particles at the particle scale. I have a student working on this since a, a few, uh, few years now. Luca is a very good student at the PhD level. And uh, we can actually simulate the flow around clusters of particle and really predict it with very high accuracy. And you see it's able to reproduce very nice you know, behavior like the drafting motion, the kissing motion, and tumbling motion. So some particles being accelerated because they are in the drafting region of other particles, and et cetera. So with this, we're trying to understand and generate closure model using very, very accurate simulation at the particle level to bring this down to a coarser scale, which is what we call unresolved CFDDM, and with which we're able to simulate systems with hundreds of thousands or millions or tens of millions of particles. So this is an example, I will talk a lot more about this later on, of a uh, liquid fluidized bed reactor. So it's a reactor that could be used for wastewater processing. So let's start by just looking shortly but uh, efficiently under the hood. And what do we do? What do we solve? How do we solve it? And where do the, does the finite element come into play? So uh, first, we are... First and foremost, we are interested in solving the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. First equation is your continuity equation. It's an incompressible fluid, so mass conservation becomes volume conservation. Second equation is the conservation of momentum. And the last term is your deviatoric stress tensor. So we have, we first, in this case, I'll be talking only about Newtonian fluids. But keep in mind that we also are, we also work a lot in cases where this mu becomes eta and is a dependent on the shear rate, for example. And this is, extremely important in chemical engineering, and it is uh, very complicated. So when you have a constant density, mathematically or physically, uh, mathematically it implies that pressure is nothing more than a Lagrange multiplier to ensure mass conservation. So pressure is not linked to thermodynamics anymore. There is no real equation of state. So it's really just there to conserve mass. And if you look at the thermodynamics of it, what happens is the physical consequence of a constant density is that the speed of sound in your media becomes infinite. So pressure information, there are no more pressure waves per se. Everything propagates instantaneously everywhere. The incompressible Navier-Stokes equation are nonlinear partial differential equation. This is, I guess, what makes them so magnificent, but it's also what gives rise to turbulence, which is a very interesting phenomenon. In the industry, I'm always very close to industrial applications. Uh, there are two, three main approaches we use to take into account turbulence, so these nonlinear fluctuations in the fluid dynamics. The first one is direct numerical simulation. So in direct numerical simulation, what you would do is you would try to capture, in a sense, all of the scales that arise in time and space in your flow. So in this jet here, you would try to capture all of the Kelvin, Kelvin and Moltz uh, vortices which are created here, and you would try to resolve up until a scale where your viscosity comes into play and dissipates the kinetic energy. So you resolve the entire turbulence spectrum. Obviously, it leads to very high computational costs, and it's not exactly feasible for uh, higher Reynolds number or complicated geometries. Uh, at the extreme opposite, what we see a lot in the industry is the use of Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation. So what you will do is you will solve a statistically average form of the flow equation. On top of this, you will add a turbulence model. So what you're doing is essentially you're not resolving any type of spectrum from the kinetic, for the kinetic energy, but you're modeling it entirely. These are nice because they can lead to steady state solution. But in chemical engineering, it's very problematic for us because as you saw in the first movies I showed, well, particles or multi-phase flows, they're inherently transient. There is no uh, bubble that is always at the same spot or you could get statistical averages, but then you have models which have tons of parameters. And uh, a good uh, friend of mine from my university, Professor Caro, would always say that uh, you know, with four parameters, you can fit an elephant. 
And uh, well, in this case, if you have 20 parameters, you can pretty much fit anything, I guess. But it's very interesting. It's extensively used in the aeronautics industry and it works, but it has some limitations. We're in my group, we're very interested in working in between. So using an approach that's called large eddy simulation, where we try to capture the larger scales of the turbulence and to capture the say a good chunks of the dynamics but to model what is happening at the scales which cannot be resolved. And these scales, they can be temporal scales, so if the time step is too large, or they can be physical scale or length scale if the mesh is too coarse. So there are some issues with solving these incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. The first one is the Ladzinskaya, babushka brezi in subcondition. So if I give a, I would say back of the envelope explanation of it, I would say that a very approximate definition would be to say that you cannot have as much information on your constraint, in this case, your Lagrange multiplier, which is pressure, than on your velocity flow. And in the end, what it means is that there are only certain finite elements that you can use. For example, P2P1 element, they are in substable. So one of the consequences also of this equation, or one of the challenges, is that the Jacobian of the nonlinear equation has a non-zero diagonal bottom. So it's a saddle point problem. And you need an adequate preconditioner if you don't plan to use a direct solver. So I want to be, do large simulations. I want to do million developments or tens of millions of degrees of freedom. And using a direct solver is sincerely not an option in this case. So the strategy we use, this is our strategy one. And this is, we have, we tried a few strategies and this is, I guess, what we kept doing in the last year or so. I uh, was hoping we'd find a better thing, but we haven't really figured out something that is more robust or better, is to use stabilization. So we introduced two stabilization, one in the momentum equation, which is a sub-G stabilization, and another one in the continuity equation, which is a PSDG stabilization. So these are both what we call petrov galerkin approach, and they transform your, they, they actually, uh, let's say, break the symmetry of your Galerkin scheme. So, uh, these are, this has two consequences, but one of the first I will talk about is that the matrix structure is, it structure is altered. So the A, B transpose and B block, they are altered by the stabilization. What it was also interesting is that you have a new block, which is non-zero, which is the S block. And this is due to the PSPG stabilization. Okay, so there is a pressure-pressure coupling that arises. It's not the best uh, condition number. I mean, in terms, it's not a very nice block matrix, but it does the job in a way that with it, we can now use with relative ease, a standard GM res solver and with a black box preconditioner. So either an incomplete LU factorization or uh, algebraic multigrid method. So this is, this is what we're doing essentially. So it might sound, uh, I would say a bit uh, special, but we're, we're solving this as a monolithic matrix. So it's a single matrix. We're not doing any sure complement or any uh, any physics-based preconditioner. And this is clearly a weakness of this approach. We just haven't found a very good uh, block preconditioner for these equations. Uh, so what is the final scheme that we're doing? So what we see is the PSPG block, it really alters the continuity equation. And, and the way to physically interpret it is that it relaxes the incompressibility constraint and it allows you to go through solution which are not mass conservative to reach a final nonlinear solution that will be mass conservative. And your and for the momentum equation, the sub-G term is something that's a bit more easy to interpret. There's extensive literature on this. And finally, while well, all of this requires a, a nasty parameter, I guess I never like having parameters, which is a stabilization parameter, which has to have units of times uh, inverse. And so um, we we the 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 stabilization parameter is derived from the three scales we have in the flow one related to time, one related to advection, and the other one related to diffusion. So in a way, it's a way to have, not the, it's a, depending on which scale dominates, we get the, the right metric for the stabilization parameters. This is difficult in a way because if things are not so much of the scale of one, like for example, if your, you feel your velocity field is at the scale of 100, or if uh, your viscosity, depending on how things are scaled, this can lead to significant problems. So this is not exactly the most robust approach. It works, but you need to make sure that you non-dimensionalize your equation correctly before solving it. So what are the key ingredients between Lete? So otherwise, we support a large variety of elements, so QN, QN, and PN, PN on simplex meshes. We can use unequal order elements also, and actually Q2, Q1, or Q3, Q2 give good results. Near systems are solved with a GM res solver. For transcend problem, we use incomplete LU pre, uh, preconditioner with very low fill level. And for steady state problem, or let's say transcend problem with larger time steps, we use an EMG preconditioner. 
The nonlinear system are solved with the Newton Raphson approach, and we try to do adaptive recalculation, the Jacobian matrix, just to save as much time as possible. At higher order, calculating the Jacobian is quite expensive. Time stepping is fully implicit. So the solver behind is a fully implicit CFD solver. We support either BDF1 to BDF3, so backward different schemes, or SDIRC type of schemes, so single diagonal implicit crunch kutta. Uh, Lete is parallelized. I did not do any of the parallelization work. This comes uh, magically for me through DL2 and uh, three nodes. And the strong scaling is actually not that bad in the sense that this is a, a strong scaling for a single simulation going from one 40 core node to 10 40 core nodes. So we have some weird uh, super super scaling issue due to cache. These, uh, this, this should not be taken too seriously. But I mean, we're able to strong scale quite well depending on the size of the problem. But we're able to leverage parallelization quite well. The issue is always the linear solver. As you increase the size of the problem and the number of core, the linear solver uh, struggles very much. So let's first talk about my first topic I want to talk about today, which is the early turbulent flow. This is work I have done with a very, very good PhD student of mine, uh, Laura Prieto Saavedra, who she's just started in her first year, but you'll see she's uh, quite fast in achieving all these very nice and cool results. So what is the flow over periodic hills? It's a well-defined 3D flow that passes uh, over a series of hills in a periodic fashion. It's a very nice computational fluid dynamics benchmark. So why? Because it exhibits complex turbulent phenomena. So I'll see, uh, show you, uh, present you a short animation of what the flow looks like. So this is a slice of the flow. The real flow is 3D. It's periodic in the Z direction. So you have very complicated phenomenology pressure induced separation from the curved surface here. So there is a separation of the flow. There is an unsteady shear layer. There's recirculation. There's an attach and detachment of the boundary layer. There is turbulent recycling because the turbulent at the right will re-enter at the left. And there is a splattering of eddies such that the eddies that are generated here, they splatter and they roll in the Z direction on the opposite uh, ill. So it's very interesting as a case because there's pretty much everything you would want to be able to model in a early turbulent flow. So this, in this case, we'll be looking at it at a Reynolds number of 5,600, but we're also starting to look at it at in the 10K and 30K uh, range for the Reynolds number. And this is the type of Reynolds number we face in uh, chemical processes in our case. There's experimental validation and there's also multiple numerical investigation to compare it. So how do we do it? Uh, well, I'll, First, what do we want to do? In this case, I'll be talking about the impact of the time step and the impact on, of the mesh resolution on the average velocity of the fluid, on the renal stresses, so the average of the turbulent fluctuations, but also on the recirculation length, which is very interesting from a process perspective because it's the macroscopic flow structure that is really uh, occurring in the flow. So you'll see a lot of these graphs. This is a comparison between experimental numerical results and our work with Lete. And what you see is these experiments, they measured the velocity at different location on the channel, and we superpose the numerical results over these comparisons. So spoiler ahead, it works. Otherwise, I, maybe I wouldn't be presenting it this much, but you're going to see more of these results. And it works quite well, actually, as a, as a benchmark. So the way the simulation is set up, it's a 3D simulation. We have periodic boundary recognition in X and Z, no slip boundary recognition in Y, and the flow is driven by a momentum source term that is there to manage to keep a constant Reynolds number. So we'll be comparing to the experiments of RAP in 2009, very good experimental work, very detailed. I, I love this article so much. And the simulations of Bruyère, and they did uh, explicit large eddy simulation using second order accurate finite volume with about 12 million cells. And you'll see we're using a, a lot less cells, but it's different type of work. It's very interesting work. And these two articles, I think they're, they're referenced in this, uh, this field. So let's look first at the effect of the time step. So time step. So what you see here is the average velocity at some location. So x divided by the height of the hill, 0 0.5, 2, 4, and, and 6. So what you see actually is for the average velocity, as we go from a time step of 0 0.1, so where we really need the implicit character of the scheme, to its time step of 0 0.0125, uh, actually the average velocity field barely changes. So there's not any changes here. When we look, however, at the normal stresses, so the renal stresses, the average of the perturbation in the x direction squared, actually, we see that there is a significant impact of the time step. And initially, I was like, oh, OK, well, we seem to agree better with the experimental results, as you see here. But as we refine the time step and we get results that are time step independent, we actually get closer to the less results for the fluctuations. So 
Uh, the same thing can be said for the shear stresses. These quantities, the turbulent fluctuation, they're extremely sensitive to the time step. And that was a bit of a surprise, surprise for me. So the other thing we would like to look into is the reattachment point. So at what point does the flow detach and reattach? And this is a very sensitive information. Uh, it's very sensitive to the mesh. And it's also very sensitive to the time step. And what we see is that the reattachment point in the flow is extremely dependent on the time step. So from point 0.1 to point 0.125, actually it changes significantly. And only at these lower values of the time step do we reach something that is time and time step independent. But then, uh, then uh, what's the point of using an implicit CFD solver if you need to use a CFL of 0.4? I do not have an answer to this. It's a bit of a deception. I was like, ah, you know, we can use a higher order and we can use implicit and we can go to higher values of the time step. And it seems this is not uh, exactly the case here. So, I mean, it's a, it's a conclusion for sure. Here we're using a fancier, I guess, implicit solver for maybe no reason. An explicit solver maybe could achieve similar results. And that's something to, to look into, I guess. Uh, second thing is to look at the effect of increasing or changing the mesh resolution. So first we look at the average velocity and we see that going from 1 million cell to 8 million cell, well, nothing really changes. Actually, it's very hard to distinguish the curve. So Laura did these very nice graphs where she zooms in regions where there is a significant difference. So what you're seeing right now is the places where the results are significantly altered by the mesh. This is what you see here. Uh, However, for the normal stresses and the turbulent fluctuation, it's maybe slightly more mesh dependent, but it's very minor. The only region where it's significant, it, it changes a bit with the mesh, is really in the shear layer here, in this region in the center, where the, there is the, the generation of the Kelvin and Moles uh, instability between the recirculation bubble and the flow coming over the hill. Uh, however, it has a small impact on the reattachment length. So this is the results we have with uh, 4 million cells, and at the, no, this is right, at the left is 1 million cell, and at the right is 4 million cell. And we see that actually the reattachment length is in very, very good agreement with the experimental results. And these are things we're not exactly sure as to why. Is it because of the way we treat the boundary condition? Because we don't have a zero flux boundary condition for the pressure. We don't have a pressure Poisson solver. So maybe it's related to that. Maybe it's because of the use of Q1 elements, which are very isotropic. So maybe they have a better uh, accuracy in the diagonal direction along the hill, the hill. I'm not sure, but we get a very, very good agreement with the experimental results. And as we increase the mesh resolution, this agreement becomes, let's say, not perfect, but is very good in my opinion. So these are with quite coarse mesh. I, remember, I recall the Lissac results that are here, they use a mesh containing 12 million cells. And here we're at 4 million or even at 1 million, the results are very satisfactory. So what if I, I become crazier and I say, let's go coarser. So let's go to a mesh that has a 250,000 cell. This is a mesh that can run on a desktop computer in a day. So we can do these very long simulation on a desktop. And actually for the average velocity profile, I mean, it's not very convincing in the sense that uh, increasing the mesh resolution to 1 million or 4 million doesn't really alter the average velocity. And this was a, a shock to me, to be honest. I was like, initially I thought, well, you know, a million cell, we need the security. And then we started to go down instead of refining and the results, they're very, they're quite still accurate. So it seems that the stabilization, so the implicit LES approach we're using by letting the stabilization do the work is okay in this context. However, for the renal stresses, so the, the turbulent stresses, they are uh, more offset. So actually, uh, we see that there is a bigger disagreement between our results and the Lissac result at this mesh resolution. And it seems really we're unable to capture some of the turbulent fluctuations without, within the flow. So some partial conclusions, what let's say I reach at this point is, this case requires more temporal accuracy than I expected. Even with the second order time stepping, we need a very low. A CFL to get time step independent results. Getting converged turbulent statistics is difficult. It's time consuming. So some of the results you saw, they require seven, uh, seven, 70, 70 or 100 flow through. So lots of flow through very long simulations. So you need about 20,000 time steps or more. Overall, there's a very good agreement with the RAP and the Breuer data. I'm not sure why we get such good prediction for the reattachment length. I really would like to understand it better. I'm not sure. Uh, the cool thing, though, is that there is no model. There's no subparameter. There's nothing. Uh, the no tuning, no calibration. It's really just an implicit LES solver. And I was very happy that we got very good results. 
I'm a bit surprised about the coarse mesh results, but it's a very interesting. And from an engineering perspective, it means that I could simulate an industrial process at this type of Reynolds number with the coarse mesh and still get results, at least for the average flow, that are statistically significant, that are relevant to what I'm trying to achieve. So on towards to another topic, a very different topic, which is the simulation of granular material. So you'll see everything will at the end add up into the simulation of flows with granular material. So granular matter, it's everywhere. So in the chemical industry, pharmaceutical, food, catalyst, and mineral powder, about 50% of the products sold worldwide involves granular matter at one point or another. Food industry, uh, chemical industry, pharmaceutical industry, granular matter is pretty much everywhere when you think about it. So granular matter, matter is difficult. It's, it's a complicated uh, type of matter because it has a discrete character. So each particle has a unique size, a unique shape, a unique surface, surface roughness, and it has very weird rheology. It can handle stress. It does not deform like a liquid. So there is a maximal packing fraction. You can have vaulting, clogging, or segregation. So to show just to which extent granular matter is a messed up fluid, the, the following animation shows it, I think it highlights it very well. So in this animation, what you see is nothing at the beginning is you blend, we blended, it's not, I did not do the animation, but we blended purple powder with white powder and we're mixing it in a rotary kiln. So a cylinder that is rotating. And we see that as, this, as we are mixing and mixing and rolling and rolling, you have a phenomenon that happens that is called demixing. So instead of generating chaos and mixing the two type of powder, you generate order. So it's as if the granular system is exhibiting negative entropy. You give energy to the system, you give motion, you give dynamics, and you generate structure. And imagine for a pharmaceutical industry, this is, this is chaos because you're trying to create medicine or drugs and you blend, uh, let's say you blend a very small amount of a reactive component A or active agent A in a passive component B and you blend it in a V blender, an industrial blender. And what you want is that all of your drugs will have the same dosage, but then you blend and the things, they unmix. So uh, <laughs> it's a very difficult thing and it's a challenge we're actively working on right now and to try to figure out in some cases. So the way we model granular powder is using a method called the discrete element method. And the discrete element method is a radical departure from finite element-based solvers. What we do is we just solve Newton's second law for each particle. We do the sum of the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. It's extremely similar in a way to uh, molecular dynamics, for example. The contact forces is the key behind DM and they're calculating by, uh, calculated by allowing the particle to slightly overlap. And this overlap, we will decompose it in the normal direction of the contact and the tangential direction of the contact. Tangential is there to re replicate friction dynamics. So what does a collision look like in DM? This is a very exaggerated perspective on a collision. What you see is the particle at the right is approaching the particle at the left. They will overlap, so we will allow their volume to intersect, and this will generate a force using an MD-based potential, so a potential that depends on the distance, and this will propulse the particle at the left to be repulsed, and it will have the contact generated. So the force model, they're relatively simple. They all depend on the normal overlap and the tangential overlap, but also on the normal contact velocity, Vn, and the tangential contact velocity. So these contact models, they are made to be slightly dissipative to replicate the fact that the particle bouncing loses a small amount of, it, of its energy. So the issue is, uh, DM is expensive, okay, because we need to do contact detection. So we need to find with which particle our particle collide. And we need to solve a very large number of uh, ordinary differential equation. We solve nine times the number of particle and we can simulate, I think the largest simulation uh, we did was about close to hundred million particles. So imagine we're solving 900 million ordinary differential equation that are nonlinear and that, are, uh, that, that make multiple part particle interact with one another. So that is a challenge. And for small particles, the collisions are very elastic. So the majority of the force or the energy is conserved. And this looks a lot like molecular dynamics in a way. And you need to use a type of time integrator that is very specific for these type of problems, which are symplectic integrators. So we use a velocity verlet scheme. So I can talk more about this in the question period if you want. But these integrators, they have the capacity of keeping the energy, the kinetic energy of the system when it is conservative bounded. So if you do an harmonic spring with the velocity verlet 
integrator, the energy will be kept bounded by a lower threshold and a higher threshold. And if you integrate in time for a gazillion time step, the energy will be kept within these bounds. So it's a form of energy conservation if you put it this way. It's not a real a mathematical demonstration, but you can actually look at it uh, from a from the point of view uh, from the point of view of the Liouville Poincaré environment. So we can do many types of simulation with this. A good example is the mixing of a drum. So this looks a lot like the simulation I showed you in the past with uh, not the simulation but the movie I showed you, where the demixing of two particle type. Well, this is a type of simulation we can do right now. And we're trying to actively reproduce these phenomena, for example, of granular segregation. So now I will try to put everything together in the last 10 minutes I have. And we will try to combine the discrete element method with computational flow dynamics in the early turbulent or laminar regime to simulate solid liquid flows or solid gas flows. So, we are interested in flows that contain rigid particles. So you see an example was made by an intern of mine, Victor, of a liquid fluidized bed that contains an alginate particle. And you see the particles are, you know, very complicated motion. There's some slight dancing. There's a nice beauty to it. And we wanted to use these numerical tools to simulate fluidized bed reactors, spouted bed reactors, or so reactors where the dynamics of the particles is very complex. So it seems natural for us that to want to combine computational fluid dynamics with a discrete element method. And it will lead to the introduction of a notion that is called the void fraction, which we will have to take into account. So uh, that's another example of a fluidized bed reactor. It's a smaller scale reactor, but you see these air bubbles that are generated. It really behaves as if it's, the particles are a second liquid or something, but there are really discrete particles of a half a millimeter in size or so. so what do we solve in terms of equation? We need to modify the Navier-Stokes equation to take into account the porosity of the bed. And this leads to the volume average Navier-Stokes equation. And these equations, they're always a pain in my neck, you know, because they're quite complicated. So we introduce the void fraction, which is a spatially varying field. And it's time derivative will act as a volumetric source term, because now mass conservation is just not the divergence of the velocity field must be zero, but it's more complicated than that. And depending on how you do your volume averaging, you will either end up with a form A of a momentum equation or form B. Mathematically, these are equivalent, but the difference lies in how you treat the pressure. Is, it, is the void fraction taken into account implicitly in the pressure definition, or do you take the void fraction and the pressure explicitly, or let's say in a different way, by uh, applying Newton's third law on the particles? So, what do these equations mean? Okay, and this is what I'll say the message I would like to get across is the volume occupied by the fluid is a function of space and time. Okay, you see it here. This is an example of a packed bed reactor, 100% fluid. Uh, here it would be about 34 or 35% fluid, and here 100% fluid. But mass must be conserved, right? So if you have a velocity here at the, con the constant velocity here, as you're undergoing penetration of the particle bed, the fluid will need to accelerate if it is incompressible so that mass will be preserved. And this, these equations, this is what they take into account. It turns out that, you know, if you use just stabilized approach or SUPG plus PSPG in these equations, it doesn't really work, okay? It, it doesn't uh, lead to uh, stable results, especially as the void fraction becomes more and more discontinuous. If it gets close to discontinuous, you get severe oscillation and the SUPG stabilization is not capable of handling sharp variations of the void fraction. This is extremely problematic for us because if I'm simulating a packed bed or a fluidized bed like this, well, I have a very sharp variation of the void fraction here at the bottom. So what we do, and there's a very nice uh, article on, uh, on this, I think that uh, I actually Timo is a co-author of it, uh, uh, we use gradative stabilization for these Vance equation. So what we do is we penalize the momentum equation Additionally, with a gradative stabilization that takes into account the void fraction because we use the full continuity equation. And when we do this, we find out that we have a lot less of these ripple effects. And these ripple effects, what they're, the, the cause is that you're, you're trying to, to um, conserve mass in, let's say, in the L2 norm. And these, these oscillations, they conserve mass in the L2 norm. So this is the ideal solution you will get if you use SUPG and just PSPG. Introducing the gradative penalization in the momentum conservation, it really dampens these phenomena and actually everything goes more smoothly. Linear solver, nonlinear solver, mass conservation, everything uh, goes well when we introduce this. So 
what is the final model we solve? Volume average Navier-Stokes equation for the fluid, Newton's second law for the particle, some of the forces is equal to the acceleration of the particles times the mass. And we couple the phases because the meshes we will be using will be larger than the particles. We need to have a coupling framework to couple the particles and the fluid. And for these, we use expressions for the pressure gradient force, the viscous stress, and the drag forces. So we have a sort of a particle fluid coupling model, which are correlations or either empirical or made through resolve simulation, where we close the particle fluid interaction using expression that depend on the relative velocity of the particle and the fluid at the particle location. And so a good example is uh, here. This is a uh, work done by an intern of mine, Victor. So this is a uh, laminar liquid fluidized bed that is operated in Brazil and that he is simulating right now. And you see the dynamics of the particle. You see actually this very, very smooth motion of the particle. This is something that we observe also experimentally. And in this case, the Reynolds number is super low. We're talking about a Reynolds number of 150. And the velocity of the liquid here is about, I think it's a 0.05 or 0.22 meter per second. So what you're seeing here is a simulation that simulates 50 seconds of physical time. So 50 seconds of operation of the bed. And we can post-process these results and, come, and we will compare them later on to the experimental data. So what we see here is an estimation of the pressure gradient to the bed. So as the fluid is flowing through the bed, there is a pressure drop. And using this numerical estimation of the pressure gradient, we can uh, calculate or post-calculate the bed average porosity, the bed average void fraction. And if we compare the, this uh, bed voidage, so calculated from the pressure drop in the bed that is simulated with experimental results, which is the red line here. Well, we see that this is a bit of a miracle, I guess, but it's in perfect agreement. So we obtain what we measure in the lab up until maybe a percent accuracy. And, and this is very, very interesting because I mean, we can predict the dynamics of these particles with quite a good level of accuracy. If you compare what is state of the art to the use of correlation, we're a bit better using numerical simulation. And with this numerical simulation, we have insight into the velocity pattern. We can do chemical reaction and et cetera. Same thing can be done in the turbulent regime. So this is another example with particles which are much bigger. These are uh, alumina particles. And uh, so they require a significantly higher fluid velocity to fluidize. And you see these churns and these fluctuations and these bubble being generated. And we're also able to reproduce this with this type of approach. So. I guess that's pretty much where I wanted to lead everyone to. So I'll, I'll conclude by maybe, uh, and I know I, maybe I went a bit fast over some things, but I'll conclude over maybe a, a recap of some of the challenges we face, where we are heading and what we learned along the way. So what I learned is that uh, developing a software makes you think about so many things I had never anticipated. First is testing and continuous integration. And the second thing is documentation. So when you write the software, very easy to understand it for yourself, harder to teach it to students. And at one point, you don't want to become a living manual. So we, need, we really worked a lot on this in the last few months for documentation. I'm very happy about it. Uh, working as part of an open source, open source community has been a blessing. It's, it's very nice. Things, they magically improve overnight. I remember. Uh, I woke up a morning and the DM code was 25% faster because, uh, because a colleague in Germany had pushed a change. And I was like, oh my God, miracle. So it's just been so much fun. And it's also a very nice way to meet fun and interesting people. So this has been amazing in terms of an experience. And it's also very good for the students because they're, you, know, you get to see and you get to talk and you get to interact with such a wider spectra of experts. So in our case, one of the lessons we learned is that we really think that stabilized methods, they are promising when it comes to implicit LES. And temporal accuracy is really more important than I expected. I feel like a lot of the CFD work never discusses temporal accuracy, or they never really do that much, or not as much as it should be done, uh, time step independent studies. And in this case, it's really important. Uh, challenges remaining. So clearly the monolithic of matrix approach we're using, it does not scale adequately past 100 million degrees of freedom. Using a block, matrix strategy. We have it in Lete, but we're not using it right now because we haven't found a nice block preconditioner for destabilized equation. Introducing maybe a geometric multigrid, maybe switch to a predictor corrector type of scheme would be a good idea. Maybe matrix free is a better solution. These are all avenues we're thinking about and exploring. And also one key point I would like to highlight is that our stabilization, stabilization approach is too naive. You know, a SUPG and PSPG, they're 
in a way, maybe too diffusive. And it's very interesting as we're starting to look into this now to head towards more, uh, let's say, robust or rigorous variational multi-scale approaches where maybe we're introducing too much artificial diffusion or maybe this artificial diffusion is too isotropic. And maybe we could get even better results at the coarse meshes that we're using for, for example, in the periodic hill. So uh, we do other stuff. Okay, I just wanted to have a nice uh, last uh, slide before the tank. So we were working right now on uh, free surface simulation, also a simulation of a mixing of complex uh, fluids, and also at the left, also other work by uh, on the results CFDDM. So this is an example of a validation experiment where we simulate the sedimentation of a single sphere. So uh, I would like to thank uh, first and foremost my students, so my group. Uh, I'm blessed, and this is the best part of my job, I guess. They're the people I like working with the most, and they're amazing. So uh, I would like to thank them first and foremost. This is a picture when we could meet meet one another before uh, all these uh, COVID issues. And uh, secondly, the Deal2 community. So this is, I think, a picture I was taking in 2019 when Lete was a month and a half years old. I have a very good memories of it. And uh, I learned so much by asking questions there and then meeting with people. So. Maybe for the students out there, you know, these you may you meet people in an unstructured context and they do things that are so different from what you do, but then you end up learning so much from them. It's just amazing. So I, this is to me one of the highlights of my last three years. It's so much fun to see people that are just willing to talk about the real things. And so that's it. I would like to thank uh, NSER, which is a funding agency. And I would like to thank uh, Compute Canada. We use them for calculation. And especially, I would like to thank the two whales clusters. So in Quebec, we like to name machines uh, based on animals we have in Quebec. So this is the narval cluster. It's uh, three, four months year old. And this is the beluga cluster. And they're actually used to study the dynamics and the habitat in the lifetime of, uh, of these uh, protected animals. There's a uh, 80 beluga remaining in the St. Lawrence River. So we don't have a lot remaining now, but uh, I don't know, I like these uh, tiny white whales, so that's it. So I would like to thank everyone. Thank my student, uh, Tony, Victor, Shahab, and Laura. They helped a lot with uh, this material. And this is my email address. If you want to contact me, chat with me, please feel free to reach out.